the end of our combined sessions with this, and I hope it's been as helpful to you as it has been to me. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll say more about this in the weeks to come, but this is not going to end our study of positive Christian living. We're going to do some things uh, to carry it on into our other classes. We'll divide back up into our various classes in a few weeks, but then we'll carry some of these things on forward. And we're excited about that because we want to be sure we're living out the positive Christian living. It's been a great study, but we want to also be sure we're moving it from the category of knowledge into action. Okay, so thank you for your participation, and especially thank you for being here this morning. Any observations from this week? Anybody able to honestly go an entire day without complaining, saying anything negative? A few takers? I may be giving myself too much credit, but I think I was doing pretty good Monday until, <laughs> until that night I went to Home Depot to buy light bulbs. You know what, how, how much of a pain it is to figure out exactly which light bulb to buy? And they've got all different kinds, LED, the old style, and every kind has to have three different colors, right? Uh, soft white and natural light and whatever else it is. And so I probably blew it then. Uh, maybe I made it another day, I don't know, during the week. But uh, I, do, I do think that it was especially helpful for me to notice it, right? Because Amanda and I were having a conversation, and we started kind of getting a little... Uh, riled, not at each other, but just at other circumstances, and I was kind of getting, you know, rant mode almost, and I said, oh, I guess I'm blowing it, hadn't I? And she chuckled, and she said, I've already blown mine, so I'm no, no problem for me. But it, it brought it to my mind, and so I think if, if anything, that's the helpful nature to just being aware of it, that every situation does have a brighter side. The challenge becomes, will we find it? Now, with that in mind, thinking of that, being aware of it, I ran across a post on, on Facebook the past couple of days, and I won't read the whole thing, and it's quite emotional, uh, but it's exactly what we were challenged with last week. And that is, even in the worst of circumstances, Christians have something to be positive about and something to find that's encouraging. And so this is a young lady who is married to a preacher down in South Georgia, and I believe she's probably younger than, than we are. I would guess 25 to 30 range. And so uh, it starts off by her saying, thank you, cancer. I'll read just a few sections, not the whole thing. But thank you, cancer, for choosing me to inhabit. I hate you, but I'm grateful for you. Thank you for taking my hair and skin. You gave me the opportunity to truly understand real beauty is of the heart. Thank you for the intense pain the crippling fear, the hopeless days. You brought me closer to my God and I talk to him the most when these three creep up and that is often. Thank you for forcing me to stay at home so often, unable to attend worship with my loved ones. You showed me how much I long and yearn to worship my God and sing praises in unison with my loved ones. Thank you for taking everything from me Every single thing. You have made me find my strength and all my needs are in Christ. And that is the greatest gift I've ever known. I believe I never would have truly understood that God is my everything if it weren't for you. Somebody on the battle lines. Somebody facing the worst of circumstances that we can imagine. Is able to have a spirit of gratitude that says my faith is stronger. There is a brighter side. And so that's... A challenge, yes, uh, but what a blessing and opportunity it can be when we will find the brighter side in Christ. Anything else to add from last week's lesson, looking for the brighter side? Okay, let's dive into worry. I've, I have been kind of running a little, little off kilter. I don't know, Hazel's out sick. I don't know if that's why or not. I'm not, I'm just, I'm a little... A little on edge, uh, but Roger did say he was worried about me this morning's lesson because the lesson's about worry, right? And I told him they may have been founded, actually. Okay, so as a kid growing up, child growing up, my aunt and uncle live on family land. And my grandfather built two or three ponds on that land, and so they keep those stocked with fish. They used to be even better stocked. And so and it was regular that my dad and I would go out uh, to one of those ponds especially. And I almost remember like clockwork 
that it seemed like every time we had to go out there, my dad had to go to one end of that where the road went over or right next to the pond, and he had to take a stick or a shovel and undo a beaver dam that kept being built on the edge of that pond because it would back up and it would begin to affect the whole lake, right? We're familiar with that? Beaver dams that just pop up and... I was doing some reading about this. It's fascinating that, you, that they're very difficult to undo. You know, so God's design and, and showing and creating beavers to build those dams is pretty impressive. But they came to almost be extinct in America because there were such nuisances at building these dams, we just kept killing them. Now they've kind of begun to make a comeback. But you can take a pond that you invest a lot of money in, a lot of effort to clean it and to, to get it like you want it. And it won't take long for a beaver to mess that whole thing up. It stops everything else up and stuff can't flow and, and it just messes the whole ecosystem up. When we talk about the power of worry, here we are, we build a, a life of positive Christian living and we let the word of God flow into our lives and we want it to flow out of our lives and we want to accept responsibility and we want to do all these things that God expects us to do. If we allow worry to stay in our hearts, it's going to damn the rest of our lives up, back everything else up, and create a negative atmosphere ultimately. We can't live out the positive Christian life while also allowing worry to stay rooted in our hearts. They just cannot coexist. It's extremely dangerous. And so that's why it's necessary that we have an entire chapter that's called Winning Over Worry. That every effort we put into living out these things will be undermined if we allow worry and anxiety to stay in our hearts. He opens, but the turner does, by saying that he preached Sunday morning and on the, uh, the, the, near the end of service he said, I'll be, back, be sure you're back tonight, I'll be preaching about worry. And a lady caught him on the way out and said, I won't be back tonight. He said, why not? And she said, well, worry's about the only thing I have left to do. And it sure sounds like you're taking that away from me now. James alluded to that last week. You know, sometimes we get so worried about not having anything to worry about. And so if we find ourselves in that mode, we might, might ought to listen to that and consider uh, the power that worry has on our hearts. It is a major enemy to Christian living, positive Christian living. It robs us of joy and peace. It saps the energy from our spiritual veins. It bitters our taste buds. Everything begins to taste sour. Every judgment we make is sour and bitter and negative when we're constantly living off of worry. Thinking about that phrase of, of robbing us of joy and peace, of joy and of peace of mind, I saw someone else who said, um, was asked, what's the greatest robber of joy that you've ever encountered? He simply said, things that never happened. I worried so much that it robbed me of what I did have, and none of those things ever came to fruition. Wor worry will rob, will sap, will bitter all that we are. So therefore, we must defeat it, else it will defeat us. Now, how do we go about w defining worry? What does it mean when we are worrying, when we are anxious? English, the idea carries the word of choking out. Obviously, the Bible was not written in English, but you go to Matthew 13 and the, the parable of the soils. It's the third soil, the thorny, thorny soil. The cares and riches of the world choke out the life. I, think, I just find that an interesting connection. Cares, worries, anxieties of life choke life out. Well, the Greek word, merimnao, okay? So around the mind would be literally what it means. Nao is the, the root for mind. It's a divided up distracted mind. It's constantly full of various cares. And so a state of worry, a state of anxiety is an emotional state of mind that chokes us physically and spiritually. And I, I think this list was very powerful, very helpful. He just kind of has it in the paragraph, but if you view it as a list, it's, it's, it, it adds up and I think is extremely helpful to, to remember. Worry will divide our emotions and thus it'll leave us unstable. It'll impair our judgment and leave us void of sound thinking. Our convictions will become shallow and warped, 
Our imaginations will run wild. We'll see things out of proportion. You ever notice that happening? I'm worried about this incident or this thing. But because I'm so consumed with it and making judgments about it, I began to wrongfully make up things over here that have nothing to do with it. But it's bled over. And now I'm paranoid about everything. It'll paralyze us and keep us from taking constructive steps toward faithful living. You see how it's directly connected to the, some of the things we've been talking about. Because if we are worried, it keeps us from being responsible, which is the very beginning of all this. And I accept my personal responsibility for myself, then I can live out positive Christian living. Well, a life of worry and anxiety will paralyze us. And therefore, we will not have the strength or the capacity to exercise that responsibility. Right. That's a great wordplay and an easy phrase. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Things that we cannot change, and so we have to let go of those things and let God handle them. It's a matter of trust, absolutely. He mentions the phrase, worrying ourselves to death. And you know, his statistics are going to be you know, 35 years old, but you type in you know, your Google browser, you know, worry or anxiety and health. I mean, it's just a strong correlation, just undeniable correlation between worry and poor health. And that struck me as interesting because if we went to the doctor, I know some in here have had to hear that, that terrible diagnosis, you have cancer. Or you have hypertension. You have heart disease. There are some things we can be told. You have been diagnosed with this. And if you don't fight it, if you don't respond to it, it will kill you. But what if we went to the doctor and he says, I'm diagnosing you with a severe case of worry, stress, anxiety. If you do not correct it, it will kill you. We respond with, huh, that's just the way I am. My mama was a worrier. My daddy was a worrier. I'm just always going to be a worrier. Right? I got so much on my mind. You know, we, we rationalize this, and yet over and over again, scientists and physicians and medical folks who, who don't view it from a spiritual perspective would tell us that that dwelling and that worrying will cause us to die quicker than those who do not worry. Okay. So let's turn to, oh, he closes that section with this. He's got two really neat kind of poem type sayings. Worry is an old man with bended head carrying a load of feathers which he thinks is lead. It's deceptive. We're carrying this heavy weight and yet it's empty. It's not really anything. It probably won't ever happen. And yet here we are allowing it to weigh us down and to hold us back from pleasing our Lord. So let's turn to look at it from a spiritual perspective. He's clear. We are commanded not to worry. So the worry of which Jesus speaks, the worry of which Paul speaks in Philippians 4, sinful. When I choose to trust myself and think that I somehow can control circumstances and yet things maybe are just out of my reaches, and so I begin to worry and allow it to overtake my life. So that's a sinful perspective because it trusts myself more than it trusts God. When you think about how many times these commands are given, not to worry. We're not to worry about our bodies being killed, about what to say in persecution. Those were given directly to uh, those first disciples, what we call the limited commission or the, uh, the original apostles, but still, they're powerful sayings, powerful truths. Do not worry about who can destroy your physical body, but worry about the one who can kill both body and soul. Do not worry about building larger barns. Don't be so concerned with stuff that you store up even more. Don't be concerned about your life, about what you'll eat or drink, about tomorrow. Those are all from the same passage that we'll look at more in detail in just a moment. And Paul says, do not worry about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. And so I think about this concept that if we were to take any major doctrine of the New Testament, baptism or worship, 
marriage, divorce, all those kind of issues. And we were to think about those. We were to think about the conversations we have with other folks. And I'm not saying we should say these things, but aren't we quick to sometimes think this way? I just don't see how they can't see it. God's just so clear about this. If they would just spend more time studying the Bible, they would see God says this plainly. Why don't they just trust God more? Aren't we quick to attach that to doctrinal conclusions and doctrinal issues? And then when Jesus says, don't worry about your life, when Paul says, don't be anxious in anything, well, but yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but I, I, I was, this is the way I've always been. This is my environment. This is, don't, don't you know how bad the, the world's becoming, God? We might do well to listen to ourselves a little bit and say, do you know how clear God is about this? That he tells us not to, but that he also is sure to give us so many promises to build up. He doesn't just say don't do it. He says here is the truth and the promises you can lean on instead of worrying or being anxious. So the command is there. The case is clear. Don't worry. It'll kill you. It'll, it'll ruin your life. But it'll displease God as well. Okay, questions, comments at that stage about worry. The biblical case, don't do it. Let's avoid it. Plenty more to discuss, but just that's a decent stopping point for now. Anybody have anything to add that we've, we've went over? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, right. Right. That's it. Absolutely. Very good. I think that's at the heart of it. And that's, that's where he goes. Your Heavenly Father takes care of the smallest, tiniest details in his creation. When you consider how much he loves you, why would he not take care of you? He's absolutely going to take care of you. We need to sort of make a difference okay. between sometimes counting the cost in something okay. and then worrying. Sure. Uh, so often, worrying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's a difference there. Right. And then the other thing is going into a certain city and going to spend a year there. Right. Buy and sell it. Yeah. Right. But leave the God out. Right. So. That's right. That's it. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Counting the cost is a responsible thing, a thing that he tells us to do, commands us to do. And so being, quote, you know, we might could use the English term, we're concerned, or we're, you know, we're worried about, you know, if we're going to have enough money to, to build this or to pay for this or whatever. Well, there, those are some terms that we might use in English that really reflect counting the cost, which God wants us and demands that we do. So living by worry, living by anxiety, is what Jesus is speaking out against here. And so we, that's where we can let kind of interchangeable English terms get us off track a little bit. Um, because this does not undermine responsibility, which is counting the cost, right? Uh, this doesn't, uh, th this, uh, like Roger said, when we go too far to the other extreme of trying to be too responsible, I'm going to do everything myself. James 4, go into this city, I'm going to make my plans, and I've got every dot uh, dotted and every T crossed. I've done all this myself. See, that's leaving God out. I don't have any worries because I've done it all myself. Well, that's wrong, too, because we need to operate out of faith. So, yeah, both of those are great clarifications for us to remember. This is not a blanket statement that any tinge of concern is always sinful. 
but we be sure that we're not living in worry and living beyond God's ability to help us. We are following him in our faith in all things. Thank you for those two things. Anybody else? Anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I think motive it plays a big deal, right? Um, you know, Matthew earlier in the the Sermon on the Mount, you know, Jesus says, "Let your light shine before men," and then later he says, "Don't practice your righteousness before before men to be seen by men." But which is it? Well, it's live out your good works before men so they'll see God. That's the motive. Don't live out your faith to be seen by men. That's the poor motive. And so if we're worried and concerned because I'm concerned about how this will hurt me if I fail, if I lose this, if this hurts, well, then that's probably something to listen to and try to correct. But if I'm concerned because somebody else's soul is at risk, or the good name of the church is at risk, or the glory of God is at risk. See, my motives are trying to build up something that's good to be concerned about. And I'm going to search him for the solution. I'm going to search his word uh, to do what's right about it. And not, still not to let it consume me, but the motive is the glory of God compared to my own failure, my own embarrassment. Those are two different things, and I think that can help us to work through some of that. But doesn't Satan love that it's a fine line? I mean, doesn't, God, or doesn't, doesn't the devil love that it is a fine line between sinful worry and concern? Yeah, he'd love for us to say, well, I'm concerned. And then that tells us right into gossip or tells us right into something else, right? He'd love for it to, to turn sinful quick. So I think that's a reminder about how deceptive he can be. Yes, Mike. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think we can help each other with little things like instead of, I would tell them, you know, here from me, I'm fine. And that, I, I figured it was easier for me to just confirm it. But it, it just, right. you know, looking out for my brother. Yeah, you looking out for your brother meant you would you do your best to let them know you made it. Yes. But them looking out for you would say, maybe I should have a little more patience with them because they don't think like I do. You know, both sides can come toward the other one and say, you know, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I I see what you're saying completely. Very good. All right. It gives some common sense keys. So these are not necessarily biblical solutions. We'll, we'll go through these somewhat quickly, but some very helpful thoughts here. Uh, it's always important to admit we do have a problem with it. And number two is especially important. Identify the source of our worry. And he clarifies it's always within us. Think about how counter that is. What are you worried about? I'm worried about so-and-so. I'm worried about this situation. I'm worried about this health test. I'm worried about... And we... It's external. Why are we worried? What am I really worried about? That may be the touch point. That may be the issue over which it's manifesting itself. But what am I really worried about that's within me? It's a powerful question. Number three is one that I wrote exclamation points around and circled. It's just practically worry doesn't make any sense. If you don't intend to try to fix it, then worrying about it is silly because you're okay with it staying the same. But if you do intend to act on it to try to help the situation, then worry is unnecessary too. So either way, staying the same, you don't need worry. Fixing it, you don't need worry. So practically, it has no value whatsoever. And Jesus is going to look at that in Matthew 6, obviously, as well. 
Number four is powerful. Stop worrying about what others think of us. I heard someone say not too long ago uh, that his father, his father-in-law told him that, uh, that he spent half of his life worrying what other people thought about him. And this man's older in his 80s now. He spent the latter half of his life realizing they didn't. You know, so um, people are not thinking about and worrying about us because they're typically worried about themselves, right? And we're, we're all consumed with that. So it's just, you know, um, stop worrying about what other people think about us. Number five is true. He repeats this several times. Much of what we worry about won't happen. Worst case scenario is helpful to ask because God's even promised to help us in those, thi- in those things. Uh, number eight, take a logical approach and fully evaluate it. Write it out on paper. What's going on? Why am I worried about this? What's going to happen? What can I do about it? Mo- you know, try to find a way uh, to work through some solutions. Number nine, uh, talk to someone you trust. We're there to help each other bear those loads just by talking. Okay, what is it Paul says, Philippians 4? Don't be anxious in anything but in everything by prayer. Talking to God's the first, the best step. I would caution, I added this, it's not a replacement for working on it. Because... How quickly can venting and getting something off our chest turn to gossip? Very quickly. Especially if it's about someone else. And so we go to, I just got to get this off my chest. So and so is really making my life miserable. Or, well then, why don't you take it up with that person? And then now this person has that weight. And then and we've got a mess. So talking can be very helpful. But let's be sure it's guided by God's parameters for talking and interacting and communicating. And then number 10, get busy, get active. If we have free time, if we're idle, uh, that only typically increases our worries. Work will increase, uh, or work will cure worry, excuse me. Okay, let's go to Matthew 6. Let's read from God's Word. Matthew 6. Someone read 24 and 25 for us. Matthew 6, 24, 25. Okay, so you notice the key word in verse 25 of therefore. He's just challenged us. We typically think of verse 24 as closing out the paragraph about money, and it does. But now he says, therefore, with these truths about money, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. So choose a master once and for all. Therefore, when you choose God, don't be anxious about your life. Okay? Someone read for us 26 through 30. 26 through 30. Okay, very good. That covers these evidences of God's care and concern in the created world, thus showing his care and concern for us. Someone now close us out, 31 through 34. Okay.
Okay, very good. Thank you all for reading. You see there, the initial point in that text Mac read was even the Gentiles worry about these things. Did you catch the question at the end of the chapter? Who worries more, Christians or non-Christians? At best, it's probably equal, right? Sometimes I almost wonder if we don't worry more than non-Christians. Huh. It's interesting. Maybe that perception may be, uh, may be common. Right. Yeah. We, we definitely are maybe at times illuminated to a little more about, about some important things. And if we're not constantly handling those things the way God would want us to, we might be given over to, to the selfish kind of worry quickly, quicker than we realize. Yeah. So you should be different is what he's saying. The Gentiles don't have a father that they answer to and can look to and say, hey, he takes care of me. You do. And yet you still worry just the same as they do. All right, a couple of points he says from this text. Number one, reestablish the priorities for your life. Verse 24, choose a master. That until we understand God is our master, then we're going to struggle with worry because we're going to think we are our master. Maybe someone else is our master, but we're going to think controlling life is up to us. And he says you can't have two masters, you can only have one. Therefore, do not worry. The Matthew 16, 24 text is, the, is one of the texts of which Roger alluded to about counting the cost. Before you, we ever come to Christ. We have to know, verse 24 of Matthew 16, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so, so often worry stems from the, our desire to control things. Before we ever obey Christ, we must know he's 100% in charge. He's the one we follow. We deny self, take up cross, a means of crucifixion, a means of execution in order to be able to follow him. And so if that priority is not first in our lives, we're always going to struggle to be able to, to overcome worry. Number two, this will be similar to that. Performs or kind of serves as a bookend of this passage. You go to the end, chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. So when we realize what is the most important things in life to do, what are they? They're things of God's kingdom. They're things of God's righteousness. We have the promise that when we put him first... He ensures that we're taken care of. It's not a prosperity gospel that our accounts are overflowing and, and we're just booming at the seams. But it is the promise that he takes care of us. Our needs are met when we choose to, above all, seek his will. He includes under number two about realizing what's most important. Don't panic. Things are rarely as bad as they seem. Quotes a Spanish gentleman, Miguel de Unamuno. I'm not going to weep today about something I'm going to laugh at tomorrow. Not a bad quote. I'm not going to weep today over something that I'll turn around and laugh at tomorrow. Withhold judgments. That's a powerful idea. So often we begin to worry because we make a judgment, a potential judgment about a situation, and then we just assume that's fact. That judgment hangs around for a couple of minutes couple hours and then it just gets pushed back as though it happened. Stop doing that. Instead, rely on God's promises instead of our own judgments. We don't know God's providence. We don't know everything about a situation. We don't have all the facts about our outcomes and situations. Tell them your plans. Yep, that's one of my... Favorite quotes. I've come to appreciate that in the past couple of years. Yeah, if you want to make God laugh, just tell him your plans. Kind of speaking maybe a little bit to the James 4 
I'm going to go into this city and I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. He may have bigger plans, but we undermine them by our own selfish pursuits instead of trusting in him. All right, number three, trust in his knowledge. Okay, so verse 30, we might read over it if we're not careful. Is it verse 30? Let's see. Maybe it's not in my, in ESV. Verse 32. The Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. God knows our needs. And so we need to trust in God's knowledge. How does he illustrate God's knowledge? Four different aspects of the created world. Birds. They're weak, they're small, and yet they are fed every time they need food. Our height. So we talked about that. Worry is prone to kill us, to shorten our lives. If worry was helpful, if worry caused us to grow taller, to run faster, to be stronger, then everybody would keep on doing it to great benefit. We would be able to document it's helpful, but in fact it's the opposite. It hurts us. He says, which of you by worrying can add just a, just a little span? Can you grow more? No, nope, you can't. What about the flowers? Flowers are stationary. I mean, you ever thought about that? He says, flowers don't pull their spin. They can't. They grow up out of the ground or off of a tree and they're beautiful, but they sit still. If they wanted to make their clothing, they couldn't. And yet the richest of kings, King Solomon, wasn't even dressed like a flower. Then he appeals to geology, the grass of the field. The grass is constantly changing depending on the season, and yet it's always there when it's needed. It's always there for animals to eat. It's always there uh, for God's purposes and, and nurturing the earth with carbon dioxide and, and oxygen and all that process. He's constantly involved in the details of the tiniest parts of creation. As your heavenly father, why would we not think he would take care of us? So number four, we must live one day at a time. Verse 34, each day has enough trouble for its own. We shouldn't worry about tomorrow. God gives us the strength for today. But he doesn't say, how about you go back and dig up yesterday's problems? Or how about you get worried about the future? He promises to forgive our past. He secures our future. Live for today. I'll give you the strength to handle whatever you need today. And so we can't get that bogged down into what ifs. That's right. Every morning's the beginning of a new day. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. That's right. Yep. We can be better because of it. We can grow from because of it. But we can't ever change it. We can't ever undo it. That's right. Yes, Brother Hugh. Yeah. Right, until they're here. Yep. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's using a human messenger, a human agent to feed those birds. Very good. Did you catch this poem? Great insight. Quite convicting, isn't it? Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, I think it must be they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. It's an interesting insight, isn't it? What, does, what, what do the birds think about us running around like we do? <laughs> Yeah. 
What, what, what do the flowers look at us and think? The grass of the field, right? It's insightful. Here they are. They're the crown of God's creation. That God has proven time and time again he cares about them more than anything. And that he has his people who are forgiven, who are redeemed in Christ, who have the promise of a future in him. And yet they run around and act like he doesn't take care of them, that he doesn't exist sometimes. So very convicting and insightful there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. It is. Yep. Mm -hmm. Possible to please him. Yep. 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 And it comes down to who do I believe in? Who do I trust in more? God or myself? As long as I trust myself the most, positive Christian living will always be out of our grasp. That it'll become a reality when we stop giving over to worry, when we stop being consumed and controlled by our cares and concerns. I will say, you know, Philippians 4, powerful passage. Um, don't be anxious in anything, but in everything by prayer. Someone said, what if we viewed worry as a signal to pray? You know, Pavlov's dogs experiment, the bell, treat, bell, treat, bell, treat. What if every time we feel that worry pop up? Oh, that's my signal to pray. That's my time to go to my Heavenly Father in prayer. Could really begin to change not only worry, but change everything about our lives. All right, thank you for your comments and for reading. Let me offer one challenge, okay? This is two weeks in advance. So we'll have next week's lesson on the 31st, and the final lesson will be April 7th. But I'm giving you, go ahead and give you two weeks heads up. On that Sunday, April 7th, bring with you a letter that you have written to yourself. Maybe it's a, a letter directly to you. Maybe it's a prayer to God, something like that. Handwritten is probably a little more impacting, but you could type it if you'd rather. But on April 7th, write yourself a letter based on what we've learned and covered throughout the course of our time together that you want to remember, that you want to put into practice, situations that you want to apply it to, okay? And so it's open-ended. Nobody's going to read it except you. We're not going to share time and, and, and embarrass anybody, okay? But write yourself a letter expressing what you've learned and what, how you want to apply it and bring that in two weeks on Sunday, April 7th. Anything else to ask or to add? Thank you so much for your time and for your comments and for reading.